Please welcome to the stage Juliana Olayinka of Channels Television, Sultan Ahmed bin Suleim of DP World, and His Excellency Lazarus Chequera, President of the Republic of Malawi. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Sultan, Your Excellency, good afternoon. Thank good you afternoon. all so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. Midtown Manhattan is very busy um, at the moment, so we do really appreciate your time, especially because we are going to be talking about an incredibly important topic, which is infrastructure development across the continent. I am Juliana Olayinka. I will be moderating this session. I am a journalist and I work currently for Channels Television, which is the world's widest reaching emerging markets news channel. We don't have much time, so I'm going to get straight <coughs> into it. Right. I have joining me here, Sultan Ahmed bin Suleiman, who is the chairman of DP World. Please give him a round of applause, thank you. <laughs> and I also have His Excellency Lazarus Chakwera, who is the President of the Republic of Malawi. You're very welcome. Thank you very much. So we know that sustainable development contributes significantly to human development, poverty reduction, and the attainment of the Millennium Development Goals. I would like to start with you, Sultan. We know that DP World is one of the world's largest logistical firms. Talk to me about your involvement in Africa and how important sustainable development is in order to boost trade and infrastructure. Well, it's very important uh, to have a resilient business. Logistics uh, and the supply chain is very fragile. And it was evident during the pandemic how fragile it was. Suddenly the world shut down, project development stopped. And we realize that we have to be involved more ourselves in investing. And that's what we did. In Africa, we are very much involved. Africa is, for us, is a very important uh, part of the world because the growth is very big. <clears throat> Africa has challenges. The challenges are infrastructure, roads, uh, landlocked countries, very difficult to reach. And so we're involved in both ports as well as uh, landlocked countries. Like, for example, a good example is Rwanda, where we have a logistic park, which is very important for Central Africa and very close to uh, Malawi. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you ensure that logistics continue to work? Everyone who is in logistics, like us, shipping lines, have to invest and have to work together. A small incident in uh, the ship that was a ground and a ground in Suez Canal delayed the world by many months. And so we have to have enough uh, warehouses in certain areas. Uh, we have to be creative uh, in using technology as well as ensuring that the right product in the same place. Uh, to deal with infrastructure. The problem we, we have actually managed to do something very interesting in Kigali. I'd like to, to give an example. We wanted to be in Central Africa to be able to supply cargoes to uh, Burundi, to Malawi, to Uganda, uh, Central African Republic. And we chose Kigali, Rwanda, because it was central. It used to take two weeks to bring a container from Dar es Salaam or Mombasa to Kigali. And that's a cost between seven to $10,000. When we get in, we start to organize it and we understood it. And today it takes one day instead of 14 days. Oh, and it takes, it costs about $2,800 instead of seven to 10,000. Gosh, I think that does and, and so, also that so, side of <laughs> improvement. So, so what does that mean? We also, what I mean is when we are in logistics, we have to be involved 
more just not just in our business. Oh. We have to understand the people business. Yes, of course. For example, in Rwanda, we noticed that people produce 130 percent more than what they need because they allow a percentage for waste. Mm. So we built a cold store. We told them you didn't need that. They didn't believe us. Yeah. And we said, listen, we will pick up your produce. So we don't wait for them. We pick it up from the farm, whether it's coffee, tea, avocados, into the central warehouse. And now they don't need to produce 30% yes. and waste it. So as players in the logistics, we have to be involved from A to Z. No, we cannot just accept things as they are. You're right. And I, I think that's a, that's a perfect case study of Rwanda. I don't think you can go anywhere now and not hear people talk about all of the amazing uh, progress that Rwanda has had. Although <laughs> I'm Nigerian, His Excellency is from Malawi, um, so it would be great to hear about more success uh, stories. And to be honest, Your Excellency, <clears throat> this is a great segue to bring you in because we don't like to talk about all of the negative stories in Africa. There has been progress. Um, the African Development Bank um, says that um, investment in infrastructure accounts for over half of the recent improvement in economic growth on the continent. So this is not just a talking shop, it's working. Talk to us about how we can get further faster. Well, you know, uh, Africa being the world's biggest untapped market, I mean, in the world, when you look at a billion customers walking on the richest soil of the world, you need to have the kind of infrastructure that will bring in all the world to that most beautiful continent with the most resources in the world. And it's almost like what we say sometimes, it's a, a golden mine that's not really been fully exploited. And so the first I would say um, of the infrastructures that we need, the structure has to be one that is legislative. Because many times without the laws that govern the movement of people and goods in place across Africa, when they are too restrictive and expensive, it makes it impossible for people to really operate within such laws. So we in Africa, we need to streamline customs procedures. We need to reduce trade barriers. We need to simplify import and export processes in order to enhance intra-Africa trade. And so member states should lift these restrictions in the spirit of the recently ratified Africa continental free trade area because the intent is good, but many times the domestication of such intents on a high level are not done locally. The second structural barrier we must address is institutional, because it is not enough to have good trade laws and policies if you do not have institutions that are strong enough to enforce them. And in Africa, we need to strengthen institutions to stop the illicit externalization of forex, stop the illicit tax evasion tactics that take resources to tax havens far away, and to stop illegal smuggling of Africa's resources to distant lands. And the third, I would say, structural barrier we must address are international development policies. There are dozens of nations in the West that have locked themselves into policies against funding infrastructure projects. Even though they are, you know, these are the ones that will unlock the African market for trade and commerce. These policies must not only be abandoned, but must be replaced by policies where funding, road, rail, digital and even energy infrastructures preferred over funding for programs. Because that will unlock everything that must then facilitate such. Maybe I can finish up by saying we must address 
structural barriers. Absolutely. Uh, uh, global financial systems, <laughs> you know, it, it's a topic on its own, but they have they had disadvantages of being too slow to respond to crisis, too rigid to meet the needs of cash economies, and too dollar dependent to lift the local economies of Africa. Yes. And we in Africa are actively discussing these things because we are serious about changing the same. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. Sultan, I'd like to bring you in on the, the topic that His Excellency <laughs> raised, which is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. I think, you know, in some rooms it's become the elephant in the room. There was a lot of positive optimism. It was supposed to address many of these headwinds you've just mentioned, particularly the vast infrastructure deficit on the continent. Not much is happening. What do you think the problem could be with that, Sultan? Let me tell you, the uh, issues are big. Uh, if you look at Africa, the inter-African trade is very small. And in fact, in Africa, we, we face it ourselves. If we want to import something from the neighboring countries, it's faster to bring it from France or anywhere in Europe than the neighbor. And we believe this is something they can address uh, through the African continental free trade. Uh, the uh, custom procedures, the digitalization custom is very important. If you look at the African continental free trade, 3.4 trillion market. That's the biggest free trade agreement in the world. We have a lot of hopes. We are very committed to Africa. We, we are invested now already uh, close to $2 billion. One of them is a new port in Senegal. We've been in Senegal for 15 years. Another one is a port in Banana in uh, Congo. And we invested more in, in, in the rest of the, of, the, of the African countries. And so definitely uh, we believe in that. The other issue also I want to touch about is the fact that Africa trade with the world is mainly commodities. But there are many products that can be produced. Mm -hmm. Look, for example, Tanzania is a major producer of cashew nuts. I've never seen cashew nuts anywhere in the world that says Tanzania. They sell it in bulk, manufacture somewhere else, and branch it somewhere else. Tea, coffee, these products, if they are produced and create jobs, it will be better for the country. And this is one of some of the issues that the African free trade has to look at. Another issue also is the encouragement of public and private partnership. Mm. Because you need to build infrastructure, you need to renew roads, you need to reach. There are over a billion people who live in landlocked countries. And that will only happen if you have governance enforced by this free trade agreement. Now there is a free trade agreement, people have committed to benefit from it, they should also ensure that these are these uh, yes. issues are resolved. You, you've raised a really important point, um, Sultan. I'd like to bring Your Excellency into this, particularly private actors on the continent. We've seen the climate emergency, a huge talking point um, at UNGA uh, this week. Infrastructure, quality infrastructure is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a huge issue, particularly as what's happening with uh, extreme weather patterns and we're seeing the damage of buildings. How can we ensure that we are having quality private sector players on the continent building credible infrastructure that is also sustainable? You talk about um, climate change shocks. These are here to stay. And so we better uh, then build in order to be resilient against the same. And if we develop regional transport corridors and we work across board to standardize certain of such processes, mm -hmm. then the quality begins to be the same in every country. And so regionally you can do that and continentally you can do that. And you know, with the African Union, once we standardize all these processes, regulations, procedures for infrastructure and other uh, instances, then even building, uh, for example, um, a, a railroad uh, from Cape to Cairo, 
can, can happen. But if you don't have a standardized gauge system, how do you do that? You're absolutely right. Your Excellency, <laughs> I, I can't believe it. And Sultan, we've, we've run out of time. There are so many questions. I'm probably going to get in trouble by somebody in the back. So many things I didn't manage um, to touch upon. But of course, we know this is not something we can resolve in 15 minutes, particularly <laughs> over coffee um, in um, an important side meet. And Sultan Ahmad bin Suleiman, the chairman of DP World, and Your Excellency Lazarus Chakwira, the president of the Republic of Malawi. Thank you so much for your expertise and insights. Thank you. Thank you.